Story One of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. These stories recorded by Phil Chenevere. Martian VFW by G. L. Vandenberg was published first in Amazing Science Fiction Stories of May 1959. There's nothing like a parade, I always say. Of course, I'm a Martian. Mr. Carruthers was a busy man. Coordinating the biggest parade in New York's history is not easy. He was maneuvering his two hundred pounds around Washington Square with the agility of a quarterback. He had his hands full organizing marchers, locating floats, placing the many brass bands in their proper order, and barking commands to assistants. But Mr. Carruthers approached the job with all the zeal of an evangelist at a revival meeting. As he approached the southwest corner of the square, he saw something that jarred his already frayed nerves. He stopped abruptly. The mass of clipboards and papers he was carrying fell to the street. There, before him, were one hundred and fifty ants, each of them at least six feet tall. His first impulse was to turn and run for the nearest doctor. He was certain that the strain of his job was proving too much for him. But one of the ants approached him. It seemed friendly enough. So Mr. Carruthers stood his ground. "'My group is waiting for their assignment.' The ant's voice seemed to be coming from the very core of its thorax, which was violent red. "'Good Lord!' Mr. Carruthers' mouth opened up as wide as an oven door. "'Mr. Carruthers, I believe the parade is about to start, and my group—' Mr. Carruthers managed to blurt out, "'What the devil are you, anyway?' "'This is the parade marking the International Geophysical Year, is it not?' The ant had a pleasant, friendly voice. "'Well, yes, but—' "'And you are Mr. Carruthers, the manager of the parade, is that not correct?' Mr. Carruthers rubbed his eyes and took another look at the strange creature. Its head was a brilliant yellow. It had two large goggle eyes, which rolled like itinerant marbles when it spoke. The low-slung abdomen was a burnt brown. It was bad enough, Carruthers thought, that these ants were six feet tall, but it was nightmarish to see them in three colors. "'Mr. Carruthers,' the ant continued, "'haven't you been instructed by the National Academy of Sciences that the Martian VFW is to participate in this parade?' "'The Martian—' Mr. Carruthers's mouth was open again. Then he realized that when the ant spoke its mouth— didn't move. He picked up his clipboard and papers from the street. His voice was hostile now. What the hell is this? Some kind of a gag. What are you trying to do, scare a man half to death? Oh, we're not joking, Mr. Carruthers. The National Academy— They didn't say anything to me about a bunch of clowns dressed up like ants. Mr. Carruthers' indignation became intensified. He was loath to admit that he'd been taken in by such obviously animated costumes. Now, look here, I'm a very busy man. The arrangements have been made, Mr. Carruthers. If my group is refused a place in this parade, we shall file suit immediately. As manager, you'll be named co-defendant. The ant was gentle but firm. The thought of being sued softened Mr. Carruthers's attitude. Well, I'm very sorry, pal, but every contingent in this parade is listed on my clipboard, and you're not. I know this list by heart. What did you say the name of your group was? The Martian VFW. Mr. Carruthers was amused. Those sure are the craziest outfits I've ever seen, he chuckled. Where'd you get them? Walt Disney make them for you? He followed his own little joke with a long, throaty laugh. The ant was impatient. About the parade, Mr. Carruthers, there isn't much time. Oh, yes, the parade. Well, let me see. He thumbed through the clipboard. 
I guess there's always room for a few laughs. How many in your group? One hundred and fifty, and we also have a float with us. Not a very large one. It measures twenty by twenty. Tell you what. Uh, you move your group to the corner of Thompson Street and Third Street. Get behind the Tiffany float and follow them, okay? The ant paused a moment to record the instructions in his mind. Then he turned to leave. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Carruthers cried before the ant could rejoin his group. Just who did you speak to at the National Academy of Sciences? I believe it was a Mr. Canfield. Mr. Carruthers's face lit up. Why didn't you say so in the first place? I'd have placed you right away. That's perfectly all right, Mr. Carruthers. Listen, I don't know what you guys do, but those costumes should certainly bring the house down. There's going to be four million people watching this parade. I bet that's the biggest audience you've ever seen. It certainly is. With that, the ant strode away. Good luck, Mr. Carruthers shouted after him. Daddy, Daddy, look, look at the big rocket. The little boy jumped up and down gleefully. It must be a whole mile long, Daddy. What kind is it? That's the vanguard, son. An autumn breeze from the East River chilled their vantage point at 61st Street and 5th Avenue. The vanguard, the vanguard, the name meant nothing to the boy. Gee, I'll bet it can fly all the way to the stars. It's the rocket that carried the first artificial satellite into space. The parade, now three hours long, continued past the reviewing stand. I want to get a better look at the vanguard, the boy shouted. The father lifted the boy on to his shoulders. The little fellow laughed and whooped it up, firing several shots from his Captain Video ray gun at the passing missile. The rocket moved on, and the noise of the crowd diminished slightly. A one-hundred-piece brass band was passing in front of them. They were playing The Stars and Stripes Forever. They were followed by the Saks Fifth Avenue display, nine small floats each depicting life on another planet. The National Academy of Sciences had success on its hands. Wow, Daddy! I want to ride on it! I want to ride on that float and visit all those planets! Can I, Daddy? The boy became all limbs, trying to squirm down from his father's shoulders. You stay right where you are, young man. The father struggled to hold his balance. But I want to go to the stars. I can watch the rest of the parade from Venus or Mercury. Please, Daddy. The father grinned. Not just yet, son. But it won't be long before man will go to the stars. Who lives up there, Daddy? Oh, there isn't any life up there yet. If no one's living up there, why does anyone want to go there? Well, maybe there'll be too many people on Earth some day, and then we'll have to find other planets with more room. Another monstrous brass band was going by. The boy became restless. He began to toy with his ray gun, half interested in seeing if there were any sparks left in it. Why can't there be something besides so many bands in a parade? I want to see another float. The father tried to interest the boy by pointing out all the famous people who were also there. A variety of statesmen, the world's leading scientists, and religious and cultural leaders, the President of the United States. The boy was interested, but not in what his elder was saying to him. He was looking downtown, his eyes squinting, trying to make out figures as far away as 56th Street. Then his mouth opened, not uttering a sound yet, just waiting to burst with joy at what was coming toward them. His father looked up at him. I wish you'd tell me what you are looking at. I'm all the way down here on street level, remember? Daddy, they look like ants. What? Ants, Daddy, ants. A whole army of them. Ain't it exciting? What on earth are you talking about? They're doing somersaults and backflips and everything. They're coming right this way. Gee, there's hundreds of them. And they got a float behind them, Daddy. A great big float with something burning on it. The child sitting on his shoulders made mobility impossible for the father. 
and he couldn't see around the spectators. He resigned himself to stand and wait for this new spectacle to overtake them. The reaction to this new sight had already begun to work its way uptown. In the distance, but getting closer every second, he could hear unrestrained laughter and rejoicing. "'Hey, take it easy!' The boy was beginning to ride the shoulders like a bronco buster. By the time they get here, I won't have any shoulders left. Where are they now? They're almost here, Daddy. And they aren't ants at all. They're just a bunch of clowns dressed up like it. He began to giggle hysterically. Golly, they're funny. <laughs> Kid, can you see them yet, Daddy? Before the father could produce an answer, the ants were in view. They were a sight that couldn't fail to stimulate the funny bone. By comparison with real ants, everything about them had been grossly exaggerated to achieve the proper effect. They walked on their two back legs, but the four front apertures were far from idle. Some of them turned somersaults, others did complicated flips consisting of two or three spins in midair. Still others, doing a kind of animated cakewalk, carried toy ray guns which they fired at random into the crowd. The guns were something like the little boy's Captain Video ray gun, only larger. They emitted little streaks of blue sparks which shone brightly but disappeared when contact was made with air. They were easily the hit of the parade, a three-ring circus all by themselves, as they pranced and clowned their way up Fifth Avenue, giving the spectators a wail of a show that was completely new. The guests on the reviewing stand refrained from any hilarity until they saw the float that four of the ants were pulling behind them. It was in keeping with the rest of the nonsense they were perpetuating. The float boasted eight larger ray guns, three on either side and two in the rear, that fired the same fascinating blue sparks. Behind each gun an ant stood on its head, wildly waving six legs in the breeze, begging to be noticed and laughed at. Above the guns, emblazoned in fiery orange letters, were the words, Martian V.F.W. This was interpreted by one and all as a punchline and was treated accordingly. It was heartwarming to be able to see the President and so many other dignitaries abandon composure in favor of a good old-fashioned belly laugh. Daddy, I can't laugh any more. The boy had to pause between every other word. My stomach hurts. Aren't they the funniest things you ever saw? The father was too convulsed to be able to answer him. Daddy, one of them is coming this way. He's firing his Captain Video ray gun at us. The boy squeezed his father and held on tight. The father took a deep breath in order to be able to speak. Take your gun and fire back at him, son. Fire away. Go on. He's just being playful. He broke forth with another gust of laughter. <laughs> I won't see anything as funny as this again if I live to be a hundred. The ant pranced over to where they were standing, firing its gun in every direction. The boy fired back. The ant took one look at the lad's gun and let out a long, cackling sound which built to a crescendo and then stopped as though it had been turned off. The ant rejoined the group and they continued on their merry way. The boy fired several shots into the float as it passed. He wanted to see if he could knock out those blazing orange letters. Martian VFW. The letters continued to burn. But in the boy's mind he was certain he had made several direct hits. The boy and his father watched the float until it was out of sight. They knew there wouldn't be another attraction like those ants. They must have been real professionals, the father thought. Such teamwork! Such precision! Each one of them having a specific job to do, and each doing it to perfection. After them, everything was bound to be anticlimactic. More marchers, more bands, a few more floats. The boy was beginning to tire. It had been a long day. Now everything was dull. Daddy, I don't want to see any more. Let's go home. We'll stay another five minutes. 
The parade somehow seemed to be slowing down. The father yawned and let his son down from his shoulders. He looked across the street at the president and the other dignitaries on the reviewing stand. All were slowly raising their hands in salute as another color guard drowsily made its way by. Soon the last group in the parade was passing the reviewing stand, another brass band. They were moving with the speed of a glacier. A full five seconds elapsed between each note of music. Everything was happening in slow motion. On the reviewing stand the dignified hands went up, agonizingly slow, to a final salute, and they stayed there. The greatest minds in the world stood motionless, unalterably still. Just as each wave of pandemonium had unfurled itself up Fifth Avenue during the parade, so now did silence take command. The little boy tugged at his father's coat. Daddy! Daddy! he pleaded. Why has the parade stopped? I wanna go home. His words came more slowly with each passing second, like a high-speed phonograph playing at thirty-three and a third RPM. Daddy, why don't you answer me, Daddy? Why don't? His father never heard him. Fifty miles above the Atlantic, the fleet of spaceships hung suspended like lanterns. In the lead ship, the ant in charge of communications reported to the commander. We've just received the first communique from the advance guard, sir. Read it to me. The communications chief read from a large perforated paper. Time, 0600. Mission accomplished. Manhattan Island cut down the middle. Immediate result of super-isonic rays. Four million dead. Rays spreading east and west. Estimated time of rays full effect. 0800. Island will be neutralized. Awaiting further orders. The ant folded the paper and looked up at the commander. Shall I relay further orders, sir? No. The commander of the ants paused and stroked his chin. We are moving. In. End of Martian V. F. W. Story Two of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jubilation, USA. Torrell pointed the small cryptopter toward the wooden horseshoe-shaped sign. The sign's legend was carved in bright yellow letters. Sartan, Torrell's companion, watched up and down the open highway for signs of life. In seconds the small cylindrical mechanism completed the translation. The sign said, Jubilation U.S.A. The doggonest, cheeriest little town in America. The two aliens smiled at each other. Unaccustomed to oral conversation, they exchanged thoughts. The cryptopter worked incredibly fast. The language is quite simple. It would seem safe to proceed. The sign indicates friendliness, thought Torl, the older of the two Capellans. Very well, brother, replied Sartan, though I still worry for the safety of the ship. Sartan, our instruments tell us that anyone who discovers the ship, Turl explained a trifle impatient, will show a remarkable degree of curiosity before they display any hostility. Sartan agreed to dismiss his worries, and the two aliens began to walk along the barren highway. Before them, at a great distance, they could see a cluster of small frame buildings. When they had walked a hundred feet or more, they encountered another sign. Jubilation, USA! Welcome, stranger! See America first and begin with jubilation. And several hundred feet further, two more signs. The Rotary Club of Jubilation welcomes and extends the warm hand of friendship to you. You are now entering paradise, brother. 
Howdy, stranger. Come right on in, stay a while, and make yourself to home. Jubilation Chamber of Commerce As members of a peaceful race, Toril and Sartan naturally found the signs encouraging. They walked at a sprightly pace. A whirring noise behind them brought the two to a halt. They turned to discover a pre-war shivy choking its way along the road. The aliens edged their way to a gully along the side of the road. They were confident of a friendly reception, but, in the event their calculations had been wrong, they poised themselves to make a break in the direction of their ship. The ancient Chevy sputtered by. The driver was almost as ancient as the car. A bearded fellow with a stogie stuck between his teeth and a crushed hat on his head. The driver slowed down when he saw the aliens. How the strangers? he called cheerily. Say, ain't you fellers a mite warm in them coveralls? He cackled merrily, put his foot to the floor, and sped on by. Sartan looked at his companion. I am sorry. I should not have doubted you, brother. You were right. These people will welcome our visit. They seem very cordial. Good, Sartan. Let us continue. One hundred yards further, they were confronted by still another brace of signs. They stopped once more. City limits. Gambling allowed. Jubilation. Where troubles never come due, cause the good Lord takes a liking to you. Where gloom and doom are outlawed, and there's never any sadness. Where a smile lights up the midnight sky, and gives off only gladness. Gambling allowed. The second sign was another in the shape of a horseshoe. Beyond this point you have four thousand three hundred seventy-two friends you never had before. Gambling allowed. Suddenly Torl stopped and played with several switches and dials on the cryptopter. What is wrong, brother? asked the puzzled Sartan. I receive no direct translation for the term gambling. What is the closest term the machine gives? Fraternizing. Sartan laughed. Now it is you who fret, Toril. According to the signpost legends, fraternizing would seem to be accurate. A steady rolling sound of passionless one-armed bandits drowned out all other noise in Oki's oasis bar. As a result, Toril and Sartan drew little attention when they entered. Except for their blue metallic spacesuits, they looked like, and were, ordinary humans. They proceeded rather timidly toward the bar. Oki, the proprietor, was on duty readying the place for the night shift. Toril held up his hand. The cryptopter had already informed him that oral conversation was the manner of communication on this strange planet. Such conversation had long ago been abandoned on the planet Capella, but learned men such as Toril and Sartan were familiar with how it was done, though when they spoke they sometimes had to halt between syllables. How de Toril flashed a wide grin at the barkeep. Just hold your horses there, mister, was Oki's sharp reply. You ain't the only snake in this desert. There's four customers ahead of you. Sartan transmitted an admonishing thought to his companion. Toril, you should have noticed that the man was busy. He has only two hands. Forgive me, brother. I was blinded by my own excitement. The two Capellans waited, and were soon attracted by the silver-handled machines that seemed to have most of the customers fascinated. Sartan wandered over to where a small group of men were gathered around a single machine. A huge man, raw-boned and crimson-faced, wearing surplus army suntans, was operating the machine. The big man dropped a large coin into a slot. He gave the silver handle a vicious snap. It made a discordant, bone-crushing sound. Three little wheels, visible under glass, spun dizzily. Anxious, screwed-up faces looked on as the first little wheel stopped. Bell fruit. A collective gasp went up from the small crowd. The second wheel stopped. Bell fruit. Another gasp. Sartan touched the arm of the man operating the gambling device. 
I beg your pardon, but could you please tell me— The man wheeled around like a bear aroused from hibernation. Hands off, mister. You trying to jinx me? The third little wheel stopped. Lemon. The crowd groaned. The big man turned on Sartan again, a wild and furious look in his eye. You jinxed me. Damn you, I ought to bust you one right in the snout. My humble Apollo, jeez, sir, the bewildered Sartan began. I'll give you your humble apologies right back with my fist, roared the gambler. Torl quickly made his way through the small crowd, which by now was itching to witness a fight. Excuse me, sir, but my friend did not real eyes. The hell he didn't, the gambler fumed. He was trying to jinx me, by God, and I'm gonna teach him to keep his paws. Okay, okay, you guys break it up. It was Oki, massive and mean-looking, using his barrel belly to push his way through to the two aliens and the unlucky gambler. What's going on here, Smokey? he inquired of the gambler. Oki, I had a jackpot working when this dumb jerk here ups and grabs my arm. Tarl interrupted with, My friend is sorry for what he did, sir. Oki stabbed a cigar into his mouth. Who are you guys, anyhow? Where'd you dig up them crazy coveralls? Such a queer way to dress in this heat, spoke a voice from the crowd. This was the moment of pride that Torl and Sartan had looked forward to. They both grinned confident grins. We have come to you from Capella, he said with some exultation. Oki's face went blank. Capella? Where the hell is that? Sounds like one of them damn hick towns in California, said Smokey the gambler. Torl, somewhat deflated, but by no means defeated, hastened to elucidate. Capella is located in the constellation which you call Auriga. Anybody know what the hell he's talking about? asked the annoyed saloon keeper. Torl and Sartan exchanged troubled glances. Sartan took up the cudgel. Auriga is a constellation, a star cluster, sir. It is forty-two million light-years away. What in tarnation is a light-year? asked an old-timer in the group. Another replied, They must be from Alaska. They got light-years up there. Sometimes stays light the whole confounded year round. That must be it, agreed Oki, and that's why they're wearing them crazy suits. The saloon-keeper unloosed a grim laugh. You can take them arctic pajamas off now, boys. Weather's kind of warm in these parts. Hey, fellas, a voice shot out. Did you bring any Eskimo babes down with you? The crowd roared approval at the witticism. Torl transmitted a depressing thought to his companion. I fear they do not believe us, Sartan. Sartan did not get the opportunity to answer immediately. Listen, you guys. Oki pounded his fat finger into Sartan's chest. I want you to behave yourselves, understand? Now that means lay off the customers while they're at the games. You want to gamble? There is plenty of machines available. I got a respectable place. I want to keep it that way. He turned and addressed the other men. All right, boys, fun's over. No fight today. Drink up and gamble your money away. Let's get back to the games. It was necessary for Torl to use the cryptopter to translate the various signs along the bar. Oki saw the small, cylindrical machine sitting on the bar. His curiosity bested him. He gave it a more thorough examination than a dog gives a fireplug. Some of the signs read, Double Bourbon, Two Dollars Ten Cents, Cool Gin Ricky, One Twenty Five. In God we trust, but nobody else. Rum Collins, one dollar. A friend in need is a friend indeed. No Indian served here. And Scotch, imported, a dollar fifty. Domestic, a dollar thirty. Cool Gin Rick E., said Turl. Come and ride up, 
Oki mumbled his attention, still wrapped around the cryptopter. Say, what is this gadget, anyway? It is a cryptopter, Tarl grinned with pride. It enables us to understand and speak your language. Ah, oh, go on. Oki managed a faint-hearted grin, uncertain of whether his leg was being pulled. Come on now, tell me what it is. But I have told you, sir. The barkeep cursed under his breath. Two gin reckies, did you say? Yes. Oki brought the drinks. Sartan smiled broadly. Thank you exceedingly. That'll be two fifty. Tarl raised his glass as though making a toast. Two fifty, he repeated. Oki caught his arm and brought the glass down. Two fifty the barkeep said with grim insistence. Sartan pursed his lips comprehendingly. He removed a large, pentagonal piece of metal from his pocket and gave it to Oki. Oki took the piece between his fingers, examined it, and frowned. I give up. What is it? Sartan had to glance at Tarl for an answer. Tarl threw a switch on the cryptopter. Money, Tarl silently advised him. Money! said Sartan to Oki. "'You guys hold on and don't drink up yet,' growled the barkeep. He then yelled in the direction of the blackjack table. "'Hey, Nugget, get on over here. I need you.' A wiry little man with a full, unkempt beard hustled over to the bar. "'Nugget McDermott at your service, Oki. What's your pleasure?' he asked with a sunny smile. "'Take a look at this.' Oki handed him the piece of metal. The old prospector turned it over in his hands, bit it, and then held it in his palm as though to judge its weight. His expert opinion was, It's gold, Oki, and was uttered without a shred of modesty. Are you sure? The old-timer was highly insulted. Am I sure? Why, you lop-eared son, stroke jackass, of course I'm sure. Nugget McDermott is drawed to gold like nails to a magnet. Why, when this here town was nothing but a patch of cactus, all right, all right, Oki waved him off. Don't get your gander up. Go on back to the blackjack table and tell Sam to give you a drink on the house. Much obliged, Oki, much obliged, said Nugget, doffing his cap and trotting back to the blackjack table. The barkeep's face was pure sunshine when he turned to the aliens again. Gentlemen, with this kind of a substitute, you don't need money in my place. Drink up. Thank you, exceedingly, said Sartan. Oki arbitrarily judged the gold piece to be worth ten dollars. The management invites you to try your luck, gentlemen. Go on, give it a whirl. Tarl and Sartan wore blank expressions as Oki slapped seven dollars and fifty cents change on the bar. Four silver dollars, four half dollars, and six quarters. Don't be bashful, gentlemen. Oki's machines are friendly to one and all, said the barkeep. Tarl removed the change and gave his companion two silver dollars, two half dollars, and three quarters. What is the purpose of the machines? thought Sartan, as they approached the one-armed bandits. I suppose that is what the one called Oki wishes us to learn. Perhaps it is some type of registration machine? It is doubtful. The gentleman you disturbed has been at the same machine since we arrived. Sartan gripped the handle of a vacant machine. Do you think it might be a kind of intelligence test? In lieu of an answer, Tarl focused his attention on a small card above the machine which gave the winning combinations. There is that term again. What term? Gambling. Tarl pointed to a line on the card, warning miners not to gamble. A look of perplexity fell upon his face. I am no longer sure the term has anything to do with fraternizing, he observed mentally. Let us find out. Sartan placed the quarter in the coin slot. The three little wheels went spinning. Cherry, lemon, lemon. Nothing. Tarl and Sartan looked at each other, their faces blanker than ever. Try it again. Sartan disposed of another quarter. 
They waited. Lemon, plum, plum. Nothing. Tarl inspected the machine from every angle, like a man on the outside trying to figure a way in. Let me try it. He put a quarter in the slot. Three lemons. It isn't very interesting, is it? thought Sartan. Why don't we try the larger pieces? A splendid idea, brother. The larger coins did not fit. Tarl proceeded to report this sad state of affairs to Oki, and was amazed when, for the eight large coins, Oki rewarded him with twenty-four smaller ones. He went back to his companion at the one-armed bandit. They then dropped twenty consecutive quarters into the appropriately named machine without getting so much as a single quarter in return. It is puzzling, is it not, brother? Yes, Sartan. From all indications it would seem to be a machine totally without purpose. It does consume money. But why would one build a machine whose sole purpose is to consume money? Sartan gave it some hard thought. I don't know. Remarkable, Torl concluded. But nothing is done without a purpose. Obviously we've found something that is. No, I do not believe that. Let me have the electro-analyzer. The aliens were so engrossed in their problem as to be unaware that Oki and two men at the bar were casting suspicious eyes on them. Sartan fished around in his pocket and produced a small object in the shape of an irregular triangle. Torl took the electro-analyzer from him, removed the cover, and moved his finger around inside. He replaced the cover and slapped the electro-analyzer against the side of the one-armed bandit. When he took his hand away, the small object stuck to the machine like a leech. Oki scratched his head and addressed one of the two men at the bar. "'What the hell you suppose they're doing, Sam? What's that gadget for?' "'Search me,' replied Sam, a well-dressed, stoop-shouldered gent. "'But if you want my opinion, it doesn't look legal.' "'Hey, Nugget,' called the barkeep. Again the little old prospector hustled himself over to the bar. "'Nugget McDermott, at your service. What'll it be, Oki?' Go on over and get the sheriff. Tell him there's two queer characters here trying to jimmy one of my machines in broad daylight. The old man's feet kicked up sawdust as he scampered out the door. Oki kept his attention riveted to the two aliens. Tarl was busy adjusting the electro-analyzer to the best possible position. What if it does not respond to this machine? Sartan wanted to know. I do not think the machine contains any type of metal with which we are unfamiliar. We will have a reading in one minute. The aliens took a step backward and waited. A sudden noise, like that of a television tube exploding, jolted everyone in the room, including Torl and Sartan. The blackjack table emptied, gamblers left their machines, a semicircle of the curious formed around the two aliens. Oki lit out from behind the bar and elbowed his way through the crowd. The aliens' concentration was unbroken by the attention they had aroused. With all the single-mindedness of religious fanatics, they continued to observe the strange mechanical device. Oki was dumbfounded to find the machine still in one piece, and doubly dumbfounded, to discover it was behaving in a most unconventional manner. It was emitting a low, steady, gurgling sound, and an occasional sputter or burp. The legs of the machine seemed unsteady. Its body lifted back and forth in herky-jerky motions like an old-fashioned washing machine. The three little bell-fruit wheels were spinning at the speed of an airplane propeller. Oki thought they might never stop again. "'What the hell are you crazy galoots doing to my machine?' he bellowed. Before the aliens could answer, there was another explosive sound, causing the crowd to jump back several steps. Quarters fell from the mouth of the machine, slowly at first, then at an alarming rate. The coins fell, bounced, and rolled all over the floor. The crowd gulped with fascination. "'Holy catfish!' said one of the men. 
How long since that blast of things paid off? Looks like this is the first time, said one of the others. You guys keep quiet, yelled Oki. The coins continued to fall for what seemed like a record time. The crowd was spellbound. Oki watched in silent fury. And the aliens were more confused than they had been when the machine wasn't paying off. The one-armed bandit finally coughed out its last quarter. The three bell-fruit wheels came to an abrupt halt, as though an inner spring had snapped. The machine broke down. Certain observers later reported that the poor thing actually looked exhausted. The sheriff burst in the door with Nugget McDermott close behind. "'Sheriff, I want you to arrest these two tin horns,' cried Oki. "'Tin horns?' Sartan's face was creased with bewilderment. "'What's wrong, Oki?' asked the sheriff. "'Take a look for yourself. These two bugged my machine and then broke it down. Look at that money all over the floor.' Torl smiled. "'We meant no harm, sir.' "'The hell you didn't mean no harm. You were out to rob me. We were only experimenting. That's their crooked experiment right there,' said Oki, pointing a finger at the deactivated one-armed bandit. "'I want them locked up until that machine's paid for.' "'All right,' said the sheriff. "'You two better come with me.' "'But, sir,' Sartan protested. We merely wanted to know how the machine functioned. You see, we are from Capella, and— Capella? exclaimed the sheriff. Where is that? I never heard of the place. Well, it is not a part of your earth. Oh, well, why didn't you say so before? The sheriff winked at the crowd. You mean you boys are from out of this world? That is correct, Sartan grinned proudly. Well, well— that does make a big difference. The sheriff turned to the crowd. All right, boys, grab them and hustle them over to the jailhouse. A group of men slowly closed in on the two aliens. Torl and Sartan backed away toward the wall. I believe they are angry, brother, thought Sartan. But why? inquired Torl. I do not know. Do you suppose the machine represented some form of religious deity? Exceeding le possible, Torl answered. As the men came closer, Oki yelled, Just get them two crackpots. I'll plug the first man that touches that money. The men were diverted by Oki's warning. They didn't notice until it was almost too late that the two strangers were halfway out the door. Get after them, the sheriff bellowed. The aliens ran as though their lives were at stake, which was true, following the same route they had taken into town. The crowd followed them as far as the edge of town. From there they hurled rocks. Torl and Sartan continued to run at breakneck speed, praying they could reach the safety of the ship. Once they looked behind them and saw that the crowd of angry men had given up the chase. Halfway back to their ship they passed a sign though they didn't bother to stop and read it. You're now leaving Jubilation, USA, the doggondest, cheeriest little town in America. Come back soon. End of Jubilation, USA Story 3 of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Moonglow. This tale was first published in Amazing Stories, November 1958. The Ajax XX was the first American spacecraft to make a successful landing on the moon. She had orbited the Earth's natural satellite for a day and a half before making history. The reason for orbiting was important. The Russians had been boasting for a number of years that they would be first. Captain Junius Robb, USAF, had orders to investigate before and after landing. The moon's dark side was explored, due to the unknown hazards involved, during the orbiting process. More thorough investigation was possible on the moon's familiar side. The results seemed to be incontroversible. 
Captain Junius Robb and his crew of four were the first humans to tread the ashes of the long-dead heavenly body. The Russians, for all their boasts, had never come near the place. The Ajax XX stood tall and gaunt and mighty, framed against the forbidding blackness of space. Captain Robb had maneuvered her down to the middle of an immense crater, which the crew came to nickname the Colosseum Without Seats. Rob had orders not to leave the ship. Consequently, the crew of four, scrupulously chosen, well-integrated men, split into two groups of two. For three days they labored at gathering specimens, conducting countless tests, and piling up as much data as time and weight would allow. Captain Rob kept them well reminded of the weight problem attached to the return trip. Near the end of the third day, Captain Rob contacted his far-flung crew members over helmet intercom. He ordered them back to the Ajax XX for a briefing session. Soon the men entered the ship. They were hot, uncomfortable, and exhausted. Once back on Earth they could testify that there was nothing romantic about a thirty-five-pound pressure suit. Hampston, the rocket expert, summed it up. With that damn bulb over his skull, a man is helpless to remove a single bead of perspiration. He could easily develop into a raving maniac. Rob held his meeting in the control room. You have eight hours to finish your work, gentlemen. We're blasting off at 0900. I beg your pardon, Captain, said Kingsley, the young man in charge of radio operation. But what about Washington? They haven't made contact yet, and I thought— I talked with Washington an hour ago. A modest cheer of approval went up from the crew members. Well, why didn't you say so before? said Anderson, the first officer. Rob explained. It seems their equipment has been haywire for two days. They haven't been able to get through. How do you like that? cracked Farnsworth, the astrogator. We're two hundred and forty thousand miles off the earth, and our equipment works fine. They have all the compers of home down at headquarters, and they can't repair radio transmission for two days. The men laughed. Gentlemen, Rob continued, every radio and TV network in the country was hooked up to the chief's office in Washington. I not only talked to General Lovett, I spoke to the whole damn country. The men could not contain their excitement. The captain received a verbal pelting of stored-up questions. "'Did you get word to my family, Captain?' asked Kingsley. "'I hope you told them we're physically sound, Captain,' said Farnsworth. "'I have a fiancé that'll never forgive me if anything happens to me.' "'What's the reaction like around the country? "'Have the Russians had anything to say yet?' "'Ha! I'll bet they're sore as hell. "'Do you think the army would mind if I hand in my resignation?' Kingsley's remark brought vigorous applause from the others. Captain Robb held up his hand for silence. Hold on, hold on. First of all, General Lovett has personally contacted relatives and told them we're all physically and mentally sound. Secondly, you'd better get set to receive the biggest damn welcome in history. The General says half the nation has invaded Florida for the occasion. Tell them we're not coming back, snapped Kingsley until the Florida Tourist Bureau gives us a cut. Kingsley, the president, has declared a national holiday. We'll all be able to write our own ticket. Yes, Anderson put in. To hell with the Florida Tourist Bureau. Captain Robb said, We'll be so sick of parades, we'll wish we'd stayed in this godforsaken place. Not me, boasted Farnsworth. I'm ready for a parade in my honor any old time. The sooner the better. Oh, and about the Russians, said Captain Robb, smiling. There's been nothing but a steady stream of no comment out of the Kremlin since we landed here. Right now, said Hampston, it's probably high noon for every scientist behind the Iron Curtain. I wonder how they plan to talk their way out of this one, asked Farnsworth. Gentlemen, I'd like to go on talking about the welcome we're going to receive, but I think we'd better take first things first. Before there can be a welcome, we have to get back, and we still have work to do before we start. What about souvenirs, Captain? asked Farnsworth. 
Rob pursed his lips thoughtfully. Yes, I guess there is a matter of souvenirs, isn't there? The others detected a note of disturbance in the way the captain spoke. Kingsley asked, Is anything wrong, Captain? Rob laughed with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm. Nothing is wrong, Kingsley. The fact is, we've taken on enough additional weight here to give us some concern on the return trip. He paused to study the faces of his men. They were disappointed. But, he added emphatically, I seem to remember promising something about souvenirs, and I guess a man can't travel five hundred thousand miles without something to show for it. I'll get together with Hampston and work out something. But remember the weight problem. First trouble we encounter on the return trip, and a souvenir will be our number one expendable. The crew was more than happy with Rob's compromise. Rob went into a huddle with Hampston, the rocket expert. When he emerged, he informed the crew that each man would be permitted one souvenir which must not exceed two pounds. He allowed them four hours to find what they wanted. The men got back into their pressure suits and left the ship. Captain Junius Robb stood outside the Ajax XX. His eyes scanned the great circular plain that stretched for fifty miles in all directions. The distant, jagged rises of the crater's rim resembled the lower half of a gigantic bear trap. The moon, in all its splendor, wasn't there a song that went something like that? The moon, in all its splendor, or lack of it, was Rob's mute opinion. The scientists, as usual, were right about the place. To all intents and purposes, the moon was as dead as the Roman Empire. True, they had found scattered vegetation. There were even two or three volcanoes spewing carbonic acid, but they spewed it as though it were life's last breath. Nothing more. The fires of the moon had given way to soft, lifeless ashes. Rob was glad he had allowed the men to look for souvenirs. After all, it wasn't a hell of a lot to ask for. A man could cut press clippings and collect medals and frame citations, and probably these things would impress grandchildren some day, but it seemed that nothing would be quite as effective as for a man to be able to produce something tangible, an authentic piece of the moon itself. Captain Robb had always tried to be a humble man. He recalled an interview held by the three wire services a week before takeoff. One of the reporters had asked the obvious question, Why do you want to go to the moon? He could have given all of the high-sounding, aesthetic reasons, but instead his answer was indirect, given with a modest smile. To get to the other side, I guess, he had told them. Like the chicken crossing the road, that was how simple and uncomplicated Rob's life had been. But now he stood, his feet spread apart beside his mighty ship, a quarter of a million miles away from home. He was the first, and he could not fight back the feeling of pride and accomplishment that welled in him. The word first in this instance conjured up names like Balboa, Columbus, Peary, Magellan and Junius Robb. The crew members deserved the hero's welcome they would receive. They could have the banquets, parades, and honorary degrees, but it was Junius Robb who had commanded the flight. It would be Junius Robb's name for the history books. He wouldn't be needing any souvenirs. Kingsley and Anderson were the first to return. They both carried small leather bags, Inside the ship they revealed the contents to Rob. He examined them carefully. Kingsley had found an uncommonly large patch of brownish vegetation. He had torn away a sizable chunk and placed it in the bag. Who knows, he shrugged. I might be able to cultivate it. Or let it play the lead in a science fiction movie, snapped Anderson. The first officer's bag contained a piece of one of these smaller craters. It had no immediate discernible value. It was Anderson's intention to polish it up and put some kind of metal plaque on it. Four more hours went by, and there was no sign of Farnsworth or Hampston. Rob began to worry. 
He'd never forgive himself if anything happened to either of the two men. He waited another half hour, then ordered Kingsley and Anderson to put on their pressure suits and go look for the two missing crew members. The search was avoided as Farnsworth entered the ship, dragging Hampston behind him. "'What happened?' yelled Rob. Farnsworth began the job of getting out of his pressure suit. "'I don't know. Hampston's sick as a dog. I checked every inch of his suit and couldn't find anything out of order.' Rob bent over the prone rocket expert. Hampston looked up at him with half-opened eyes and an insipid grin on his face. He mumbled something about, "'A fine state of affairs.' They removed Hampston's suit and placed his limp figure on a bunk. Rob examined him for forty minutes. He reached the curious conclusion that Hampston was as fit as a fiddle. The rocket expert fell asleep. Rob and the rest of the crew prepared to blast off. The Ajax XX thrust itself through space, halfway back to its home planet. The excitement of her crew members grew with every passing second. In his concern over Hampston, Farnsworth had forgotten about his souvenir. He now opened his bag and displayed it before the others. "'What is it?' asked Kingsley. "'Dust,' was Farnsworth's proud reply. "'What the hell are you going to do with dust? Maybe you don't know it, but this is going to be the most valuable dust on the face of the earth.' Do you realize what I can get for an ounce of this stuff? What's anybody want to buy dust for? Souvenirs, man, souvenirs. Farnsworth asked to see what Kingsley and Anderson had picked up. The two men obliged. For the next hour the three men and Rob discussed the mementos and their possible uses on earth. Then Anderson said, I sure wouldn't turn down about a gallon of good Kentucky whiskey right now. Rob laughed. We did enough sweating on the way. You wouldn't want to sweat out the trip back on a belly full of booze. That may be a better idea than you think it is, Captain. The four men turned to find Hampston sitting up on his bunk. Hampston! Rob exclaimed. How do you feel? Terrible. What happened to you? Hampston stared at each man individually. He took a deep breath, and his cheeks puffed up as he let it out slowly. Well, I guess you'd better know now. Rob frowned. What do you mean? Farnsworth and I separated after we got about four miles from the ship. I thought I saw something that looked like a cave. I figured I might find something interesting there to take back with me. So I told Farnsworth I'd keep radio contact with him, and off I went. Did you find a cave? Rob wanted to know. No, it was just a big indentation in the wall of the crater. I threw some light on it and found it to be ten or fifteen feet deep. He paused, as though not sure of what to say next. So? So that's where I found my souvenir. Well, let's see it, said Anderson. Hampston opened his leather bag. The object he removed rendered the crew weak in the knees. He said, We can have that drink, Anderson, but I don't think we'll enjoy it. He poured them each a shot from a half-filled bottle of vodka. End of Moonglow Story 4, Part 1 of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Observers, Part 1. This story was first published in Amazing Stories, November 1959. A job as laboratory technician with the Army Weapons Development Center carried about as much prestige as a Bat-Boy in a World Series. George Fisher was a laboratory technician. He was a shy but likable fellow, a diligent worker and trustworthy. He didn't talk. He was rarely talked to. He had no burning ambition to push himself ahead in the world. Being an assistant to the brains was good enough for him. 
He had a commendable talent for minding his own business. In a security job, these qualities counted ahead of scientific knowledge. One day, George Fisher turned up dead. The initial shock and concern experienced by his superiors was soon overcome by the coroner's finding. Suicide. Harry Payne was the civilian personnel director of Fort Dixon. It was his job to find a replacement for George Fisher. Miss Conway, Harry's voice lashed into the intercom. There was an interminable pause. He cursed under his breath. Then, yes, Mr. Payne? Where the hell were you? Never mind. Bring me the file on George Fisher. George Fisher? Miss Conway was in her favorite state of mind. Confusion. But he's dead, isn't he? Harry let out a deep, anguished groan. Yes, Miss Conway, he's dead. That's why I want his file. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Be there in a jiffy. Harry could tell she was bubbling over with smiles as she spoke. A few more centuries would pass, he thought, before they manufactured another broad as dumb as Miss Conway. He stuffed his hands in his pockets and looked out the window. Across the parade ground he could see the Army Weapons Development Center. He had no idea what new bomb they might be working on behind those heavily guarded fences. He didn't care. He was only concerned with the people who worked there. The rest of Fort Dixon used mostly civil service personnel, but the barricaded security jungle across the parade grounds was more particular about its hired help. A person's record had to be spotless almost from the day of his conception, or a person could not even gain entrance. Harry had never been inside weapons development. He had once been to traffic court as a roaring juvenile eighteen years before. That was enough to bar him from even visiting. He realized, though, that the Army couldn't afford to take chances. Hiring new technicians required an arduous screening process. Harry loathed it. He was thankful that the personnel at Weapons Development were highly paid and usually permanent. He never had to hire more than one person a year. Miss Conway swept into the office and handed Harry the folder. Thanks, he muttered. Don't mention it, boss. Harry called after her as she went back toward the reception room. Stay at your desk, will you? The government may need you. A muffled giggle was her only response. Miss Conway was a civil service employee. She had been Harry's secretary for six months. Like most other civil service personnel, According to Harry's way of thinking, she was a tower of inefficiency. His chief annoyance stemmed from the fact that the Army had arbitrarily placed her in his office. He had been given no choice in the matter. It was one hell of a way to treat a personnel director, he thought. He sat at his desk, gloomily aware of the headaches he'd have to face in his quest for George Fisher's replacement. He opened the folder and glanced at the vital statistics. Fisher, George, age 40, weight 160, height 5 foot 9, eyes green, hair none, complexion light, date of employment 10758, date of departure 41259, reason suicide, etc., etc. Harry yawned. Statistics bored him. He turned to a page marked Qualifications and started reading. The phrase, Education and Experience in Nuclear Physics Required, caught his eye. The requirement was no surprise to him, but whenever he saw it he took a few minutes off to indulge his curiosity. What was the big project at weapons development? He loved to know. He couldn't find out, of course and the inability to find out naturally gave his imagination the widest latitude. His most persistent theory involved an atomic-powered rocket capable of knocking the Russians' manned satellites out of space. 
The Russians were still ahead of everyone, and their latest satellites were heavily armed. As usual, they were lording it over the rest of the world, and the rest of the world had not come up with an effective answer to this challenge. Harry closed the folder. He glanced at a list of technical schools. He would call each of them and ask them to submit a list of lab technicians. He would also look over the field of technicians still left in private enterprise. The intercom buzzed. What is it, Miss Conway? Miss Ralston is here. Who is Miss Ralston? She has an appointment with you. An appointment? Harry was baffled. Who made it? I did. I guess I forgot to tell you. Harry closed his eyes and counted to ten. Thank you, Miss Conway. Will you step into my office for a moment? He tried to control his mounting anger. She breezed into the office. Now, Miss Conway, will you please tell me who is this Miss Ralston? She operates Ralston Personnel Consultants. I think she wants to talk to you about the replacement for George Fisher. Uh, you know, the one who died? Yes, yes, I know. And you know, Miss Conway, we don't do business through agencies. Oh, Miss Ralston doesn't run an agency. She told me. Her business is much more exclusive than that. She handles very highly specialized people. That's the reason why I know. That's why you gave her an appointment with me, said the exasperated personnel director. Well, you can go right back out and tell her I've canceled the appointment. This is a security job we're filling, and— Before Harry could utter another syllable, his attention was drawn to the doorway. The view to the outer office was blocked by a bundle of curves. The most alluring female bombshell his eyes had ever beheld put everything important out of his mind. "'I didn't realize you were being so inconvenienced, Mr. Payne. I'm terribly sorry.' Her eyes drooped. "'I can take my business elsewhere.' Miss Ralston's voice was just above a half-whisper. The words came out warm and intoxicating. "'No, wait, wait a minute, Miss Ralston.' Harry was out of his chair and at the door. He took her arm. Who said anything about inconvenience? Come in, come in. That'll be all, Miss Conway. Thanks. The secretary giggled and left. Miss Ralston sat down and lit a cigarette. Harry noticed she was wearing a beige knit suit with a neckline that spoke volumes. Each curve was in the right place. Every movement had another movement all its own. Harry knew she was bound to talk business, and he knew there wasn't much he could do for her in that direction. But at thirty-five and eligible, he just couldn't let this woman leave his office. Harry Payne was a sucker for a gorgeous face. He knew it, and he knew the gorgeous face knew it. Tell me, Miss Ralston, when did my secretary arrange this appointment for you? I called yesterday. Harry arched his eyebrows and smiled. Yesterday? What prompted you to call me? You're looking for a laboratory technician, aren't you? What gave you that idea? He asked, not caring in the slightest what gave it to her. I make it my business to comb the papers every day, Mr. Payne. I came across the news of George Fisher's suicide and called you. Simple as that. You don't waste any time. She smiled and pursed her lips. Do you? I try not to. I have seven clients who would qualify for the job. I'd appreciate it if you'd see them. Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Ralston, she leaned forward with an inquisitive, Yes? Harry cleared his throat. As a matter of fact, I'm not supposed to do business with civilian agencies. Mr. Payne, she smiled demurely, do I look like an agency, or do I look like a personnel consultant? Now there was an opening, Harry thought, but it might be best to avoid it. You're working to get someone a job. It amounts to the same thing. I see. Then how do you go about hiring your new personnel? I do the soliciting myself. 
Sorry, Miss Ralston, but I don't make the rules and regulations. But the lady was undeterred. She crossed her legs and sank further into the easy chair. Her eyes sparkled at Harry. These clients of mine are all top men, Mr. Payne. Why couldn't I just leave you their names? You can still do the soliciting. I'd be happy to forego my regular commission on this job. Call it the value of prestige. Harry recognized another opening, and this time plunged in. Suppose we talk it over later. There's a place at Fourth Avenue and Woodward called Maria's. Best Italian food in captivity. I'm through at five. What about you? She didn't have to say anything. Her eyes told him he would be having an Italian dinner that night. And not alone. She rose and walked in front of his desk. I'm so glad we have something in common, Mr. Payne. I can't think well on an empty stomach either. After walking her to the outer office, he came back to his desk. He took a deep breath and loosened his tie. Dreams like Miss Ralston didn't materialize every day. For a first meeting, he figured he hadn't fared too badly at all. And if this first date went well, he was sure he'd be seeing a lot of this girl. It did not escape Harry's mind that here was a girl who was in the habit of getting what she wanted. But why not? Her powers of persuasion were grade A. They were so good they presented him with one big problem. He had regulations, army regulations. He couldn't violate them. Miss Ralston, it was obvious, was going to meet him solely for the purpose of getting a client a job. Would he be able to see her again after she knew he had no intention of hiring that client? The following morning, Harry entered the office to find his secretary unusually busy. She was pecking away furiously at the typewriter. He handed her a sheet of paper and said, Miss Conway, copy these names and addresses, and when they— When they come in, you'll see them at half-hour intervals, she smiled benignly. Miss Ralston just called and told me. Pretty smart chick, huh, boss? Harry did a slow burn and ambled into his office. Miss Conway was right, of course, and that's what annoyed him. It had been quite a night. He whined and dined her. They did all the bright spots. And, wonder of wonders, on the first date they wound up at Paula Ralston's apartment. She was a captivating hostess, an exquisite dancer, and something of a sorceress. After one kiss, an unforgettable one, Harry had agreed to interview her seven clients. But all this was last night, Harry reminded himself. Today was a different matter. He was in the sanctity of his office now, and capable of clearer thinking. Paula Ralston had accomplished the first phase of her mission. The next move was his. Seeing the clients, he rationalized, was not violating the regulations, and for the moment it satisfied her. She certainly was a determined girl. Anyone would think, watching her operate, that a lab technician was a job of world-shaking importance. What the hell, he shrugged. If the girl didn't look out for her own interests, she wouldn't have a successful business. There's only one way to keep clients happy, and that's to keep them busy. Besides, her maneuvering wasn't going to work anyway. He just couldn't hire any of them. His problem now was to stall her for a couple of days so he could keep seeing her. In the end, he might possibly tell her the army had refused to accept any of them. He glanced out the window and saw the weapons development center across the parade ground. Business appeared to be going on as usual. Routine, quiet, cautious. High time I started thinking seriously about that replacement, he thought. There was a knock at the door. Come in. Miss Conway bounced in. They started to arrive. The first one is Mr. Thompson. Okay, let's get started. Send him in. Thompson was a small, roundish man in his mid-forties. He remained quite at ease during the interview. Harry began the session in the usual dull manner, 
formulating his questions from the several sheets of information Mr. Thompson had brought with him. It wasn't long before Harry detected something unusual about the man, but he couldn't determine what it was. He became more alert, more interested as the interview progressed. Where are you from originally, Mr. Thompson? Chicago. Oh, yes. He glanced at the written information. I see you went to the university. Yes, sir. My practical experience is documented on the second sheet. What was it about this guy? He was overly polite, but that could hardly be considered strange. His answers were brief, to the point. Even curt. That was just a personality trait, Harry supposed. Couldn't condemn a man for that. How long did you live in Chicago? Twenty-one years, sir. Are you married? No, sir. He had noted before that Mr. Thompson had a distracting habit of patting his hair. Now he knew why. He was wearing a toupee. Harry wondered if the poor guy was sensitive about it. If he was that conscious of it, it might account for his strange attitude. Thank you for coming in, Mr. Thompson. I'll submit your papers to Colonel Waters. If he has any further interest in you, don't be surprised if you receive a visit from a couple of intelligence agents. That's routine for this job. I just tell you in advance so you won't worry. I understand, he said rising and checking his toupee once more. Many thanks to you, sir. He shook Harry's hand and left the room. Harry glanced at the papers again. Mr. Thompson's background was impressive indeed. There didn't seem to be much question as to his ability, but what a queer duck he was. The second applicant was a short, wiry man named Chase. Like his predecessor, he was brief and to the point with his answers, he let his qualification papers speak for themselves. He was formal and polite. Midway through the interview, Harry noticed that he too was wearing a toupee. If that wasn't the damnedest coincidence! Fortunately, Mr. Chase didn't have the annoying habit of patting his head every thirty seconds. Harry guessed he either had a more expensive one, or was just endowed with more confidence that it would not slip off. The interview over, Mr. Chase offered his thanks and strolled out. Harry had a few moments to himself before Paula's third client arrived. He thought about the first two men. Funny thing about toupees. Even the most expensive ones could always be detected. He couldn't quite understand why the two men wore them. They were often used by playboys, actors, self-styled over-age Romeos, people whose niche in society depends upon their looks. But not scientists or technicians. In fact, Harry couldn't remember ever having known one such person who shunned his baldness in this manner. That didn't mean they had no right, but it did seem peculiar as hell. By the time the third interview was over, Harry Payne's curiosity was ablaze. Applicant number three, Mr. Bowles, was not only wearing a toupee, but had gone one step further. Just north of his mouth there was a mustache, a good-looking mustache, well-groomed and shaped, but phony as a wax banana. For a moment he thought Paula Ralston might be perpetrating a joke of elaborate proportions. He rejected the idea as fast as it came to him. He didn't know the girl very well yet but he knew her well enough to know she was strictly business. She wanted one of these men to get that job. He flipped the intercom button for Miss Conway. She might be able to tell him indirectly. You wanted to see me, Mr. Payne? Yes, Miss Conway. The three men who've already been in here, have you noticed anything strange about them? Her eyebrows merged and spelled perplexity. She pursed her lips and gave the matter the gravest consideration. Then she concluded, Yes, something very strange. Harry was hopeful. What was it? None of them did very much talking. Strictly anti-social types. Harry groaned, realizing he should have known better. Thank you, Miss Conway. That's all. The fourth guy is waiting outside. Let him sit for a couple of minutes, then send him in. 
he decided to put the whole matter out of his mind and get the interviews over as fast as possible. There were other, more serious duties to attend to. The toupee episode was probably nothing more than a crazy coincidence anyway. Strictly an item for believe it or not. By two o'clock that afternoon, the four remaining candidates had come and gone, and Harry Payne sat at his desk in the immediate aftermath questioning his sanity. All seven men wore toupees. It was incredible, but true, and now the matter was one of deep and abiding concern to him. There was nothing funny about it. There was a touch of the macabre in it that rendered his flesh cold and weak. He lit a cigarette and tried to pull his thoughts together. Seven men applying for the same job, seven men with one thing in common, seven men as bald as Dr. Cyclops. Harry had to abandon the notion that sheer coincidence brought these men together. That was too fantastic. They were brought together by design. Their backgrounds varied in that they had all worked and come from different parts of the country, but those facts were only on paper. It was an odds-on bet they all knew each other. There was even something about the order in which they arrived in the office that indicated a pattern or an overall plan. Numbers three, five, and six had worn false mustaches. If it was true that the seven men were well acquainted, then Paula Ralston could undoubtedly give him some answers. Harry had another dinner engagement with her at five o'clock, but this date, he told himself, would be different. He was going to be all business until he learned exactly what she was involved in. He picked up the phone, got an outside line, and dialed. Frank Barnes was a private detective. A good one. Harry was sure he could rely on him for a small favor. A subdued, resonant voice answered on the other end. Frank, Harry Payne here. Harry, where you been hiding? I need a favor. The only time you ever call me, you ingrate. There's a dame called Paula Ralston, runs a business called Ralston Personnel Consultants. How soon can you get anything on her? How soon do you need it? Today, if possible, you can call me at home any hour. After promising Frank to meet him for lunch one day, Harry sank into an easy chair and tried to shake the unnerving effect the seven men had had on him. Maybe he shouldn't have called Frank. This might be something he should have informed the army about. No, they'd want to know what business he had seeing the seven men in the first place. He didn't have much of an answer for that one. Driving along Woodward Street toward Fourth Avenue, Harry was beset with one nagging question. Why had Paula Ralston never brought any of her clients to see him before? He was the dispenser of over a hundred good jobs that offered high salaries. The answer was just as persistent as the question. Lab technician was the only security job he handled. She was determined that one of her men get that job at any cost. It wasn't a very pleasant thought. Harry didn't want to believe it. He didn't want to believe that Paula Ralston was going to mean trouble for him, and yet he knew that's exactly what she meant. She was waiting for him at Maria's. She kissed him as he slipped into the booth beside her. Through four drinks and a six-course dinner, he watched her smile. That smile could melt down the door of a bank vault. He noticed how she laughed at all his wisecracks. When it was her turn to talk, she talked about him. She offered a toast to their closer friendship, with special emphasis on the word closer. But she did not mention the seven men. That was the smart approach, Harry ventured. She'd save that until she got home and slipped into something more comfortable. He stood alone in Paula's living room, nursing a scotch on the rocks. The night before, he had been too concerned about his progress with this latter-day Aphrodite to give a damn about the place she lived in. He glanced around the room. Every inch reeked of success. 
The furniture was sleek, modern, exquisitely contoured, like its owner. There wasn't much question about it. Paula Ralston made a lot more dough than he did. But how? That was the question. She came out of the bedroom and mixed herself a drink. She was a living dream in a black lace negligee. Transparent. It figured. A lot of things were beginning to figure. "'Shall I tell you a secret?' she asked. "'I didn't think you had any left. He couldn't take his eyes from the negligee.' "'I think Mr. Chase and Mr. Bowles are the best of the seven. I think they come closest to what you're looking for.' She lifted her glass and clinked it against his. Harry smiled. He wasn't looking at her any more. It was more of an education to look through her. She was good, damn good. She could lull you into believing the Grand Canyon was brimming over with silver dollars, all yours for the taking. It was next to impossible to doubt the sincerity in her face. I liked all seven of them, he said. But since you know them better than I do, I'll take your recommendation that Chase and Bowles are the best. She moved closer to him. He could feel the warmth of her body. We're making some progress, Harry. We've narrowed the field down to two candidates. Harry kept her maneuvering. Paula, I'm still faced with the problem of finding a way around the regulations. I can't hire either one of them until I solve that. Nothing stopped this girl. Nothing even slowed her down. She moved still closer to him. There's a way around everything, if a man has the right incentive to look for it. He knew what the right incentive was. He didn't have to go looking for that. He laid his drink down, put his arms around her, and kissed her. They walked to the sofa. Paula stayed close to him, the ever-thoughtful, loving female companion. She rubbed his back and neck and sprinkled him with soft, moist kisses. She never mentioned her clients again, and Harry promised to hire one of them the following day. He was anxious to get back to his apartment to find out if Frank Barnes had called. As he drove back along Woodward Street, he couldn't put Paula out of his mind. He already had her character pegged. But what was she up to? What was her goal? She wasn't doing all this for a lousy commission. The stakes were bigger than that. In a way, it was too bad she was going to have to settle for less than she bargained for. If her seven clients hadn't been so phony, she might have gotten away with it. But why was it necessary for them to be phony? Why should a girl, as shrewd as Paula, send seven men in disguise to see— Disguise! Somehow that word threw a different light on the matter. The men had all been disguised in places where hair should grow. They were not bald. There was something abnormal about them. And Harry was ninety percent certain what it was. The answer was incredible. There was still a ten percent margin for error. For Miss Paula Ralston's sake, he hoped he was wrong. End of the Observers, Part 1「Four, Part Two of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Observers, Part Two. Frank Barnes's message was waiting for him at the switchboard in the lobby. The word urgent was written on it. He raced upstairs and picked up the phone. Frank answered on the first ring. He sounded like a man with a gun at his back. Harry, what the hell kind of mess have you gotten yourself into? Why, something go wrong? You bet your sweet life. An hour after you called me to check on that Ralston dame, a guy came into the office and told me to lay off. Harry was silent and scared. His answer looked better all the time. What did the guy look like? He looked important, Harry. And he meant business. 
He had a big bulge in his pocket, and he made it very clear I'd be up to my funny bone in hot lead if I relayed any information about this girl to you. Frank was the guy wearing a toupee? A what? A toupee, a hairpiece. How the hell should I know? I wasn't interested in his coiffure. He was wearing a black overcoat. He kept his hand on that bulge, and he didn't care much for smiling. Harry, you in trouble with this dame? What did you find out about her, Frank? Between the time you called me and the time the guy strolled into the office, I found out she's only had this personnel consultant racket for about three months. You didn't learn anything else? After I got warned, I decided to wait till I talked to you. Harry was silent again. His mind was working. Frank, what causes baldness? Baldness? Jeez, Harry, you're in a fat mess of trouble and you're worrying about losing your hair? It's important, Frank. I must find out what causes total loss of all hair. The detective grunted. <clears throat> well, let's see. There are three or four diseases I know of. Some people claim it's hereditary. Sometimes a deficiency in the genes. Okay, Frank, that's enough. What do you want me to do about the girl? Just as the man told you, lay off. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what this thing is all about. He hung up the phone and paced in front of his sofa for several minutes. It was inconceivable that the seven men all had the same disease, the same gene deficiency, or the same hereditary shortcomings. So his own answer must be closer to the truth. He'd have to wait until morning to put it to a test. If he was right, he would call Colonel Waters and dump the whole bizarre setup right into the Army's lap, where it belonged. Again he found himself hoping he was not right, and, more important, that Paula Ralston wasn't what he was beginning to think she was. Miss Conway was already in when Harry arrived at the office. He managed a half-smile for her. Miss Conway, two of the seven men are coming back this morning, and, and Mr. Bowles is the one who's getting the job. Who called you this time? he asked with exasperation. Colonel Waters? Harry's stomach muscles contracted. Colonel Waters? That's right. When you were gone yesterday, the colonel dropped in to see you. He asked me if you were working on the replacement for George Fisher. I told him you were right on the job, and I showed him the information sheets you had on all seven men. You did what? And Colonel Waters liked the man named Bowles best of all. So I guess when Mr. Bowles comes in, you can tell him the job is his. You nitwit, he bellowed. You brainless, knuckle-headed! He stomped into his office and slammed the door. It was difficult for him to think clearly. He knew he had to make a move, and fast. He stood by the window and gazed at the weapons development center across the parade ground. The low gray buildings had a quiet, peaceful aura about them. If it weren't for the guards marching in front of the great wire fences, anyone might think the place was used for manufacturing can openers, automobile parts, or any one of a thousand harmless products. But it wasn't. Weapons development represented a vital link in the country's defense program. He no longer figured they were developing a weapon to counteract Soviet aggression. They were working on something far more important. He was just ninety percent sure of that. Mr. Bowles was the first to arrive. He sat in an easy chair, which Harry had moved close to his desk, in order to better observe the man. Mr. Bowles, my secretary, tells me Colonel Waters was looking at your qualifications yesterday and was very impressed. I gather from that that the job is yours. Thank you, sir. Harry shoved his chair closer to him. The toupee was intact. So was the moustache. Now it'll take the government about two weeks to complete a security checkup. He could see plainly now that the man was also wearing false eyebrows and had no beard. That did it. I understand, sir, Bowles replied. So all I can tell you at the moment is that you'll be hearing from us as soon as possible. Harry got up, thinking the interview was over. Mr. Bowles remained seated. Miss Ralston would like to see you, Mr. Payne. 
Oh, yes, <laughs> Harry chuckled. I'm going to see her this evening. She wants to see you now. Afraid I can't make it right now. I have a pile of work to do. Besides, I'm expecting another client of hers. Have to let him know he didn't get the job. Mr. Chase is waiting for us downstairs in the car. You will come with me, Mr. Payne. The order was clear and firm. Harry didn't like it. I don't get it. What's so important that Miss Ralston has to see me? He stopped at the sight of the gun leveled at his chest. When we pass your secretary's desk, you will tell her you are taking an early lunch. I will return you in an hour if you cooperate. Harry Payne knew better than to argue. Mr. Chase was seated behind the wheel of a blue sedan. Bowles and Harry climbed into the back seat. They drove away from Fort Dixon toward the city. The two men remained silent during the trip. Harry had plenty of time to think. Why this sudden move of Paula's? He must have done something to motivate it, but what? The only person he had talked to was Frank Barnes, and he hadn't divulged anything to him. She couldn't be sore because he had asked Frank to check up on her. Routine investigation was part of his job. She knew that. He failed to come up with an answer. He was worried. He knew who the seven men were, but he didn't know where they came from. It could have been any one of a million different places. Heaven only knew what kind of people they were. The shades were drawn in Paula's apartment. There was no sign of her. But as soon as Harry entered the room he forgot about her anyway. His gaze rested upon the small, roundish man sitting in the contour chair, the bald man with no eyebrows and no beard. "'Please be seated, Mr. Payne.' The man's tone was soft and courteous. "'Which one are you?' Harry asked. The man was amused. "'I am Mr. Thompson.' "'Oh, yeah,' said Harry. "'You're the one who kept patting your skull. "'Couldn't you find one that fits you?' Nobody was amused. Bowles and Chase took positions on either side of Thompson. Their faces were drawn and sober. They resembled two bankrupt morticians. "'Where is the body beautiful?' Harry asked. "'Or is she no longer the body beautiful?' "'Take a look for yourself.' It was Paula's voice. The familiar sultriness was missing. Harry swung around to see her emerge from the bedroom. "'Well, well, well. If it isn't Miss Lonely Hearts, mind if I ask why I'm here? I mean, the gun and all?' He had to be flippant. It was the only way he knew to conceal the terror he felt in their presence. She sat down beside him on the sofa. "'Harry, you've disappointed me. You haven't been playing the game fair and square.' If you're referring to the private eye I put on you. I'm not, Harry. You put him on, we took him off. Those things even themselves out. Harry shrugged. Okay, I give up. What did I do wrong? Show him, Mr. Thompson. She lit a cigarette and folded her legs under her. Mr. Thompson reached into his pocket and produced a small object. He tossed it into Harry's lap. Harry examined it. Do you recognize it? Mr. Thompson asked. It's a microphone, Harry replied. That's just what it is. Paula savagely flung her cigarette to the floor. Her own disguise, the one concealing her true, ruthless self, was gone. Her voice was cold and harsh. How much do you know, Harry? How much? Harry folded his hands, rested his full weight on the arm of the sofa, and crossed his legs. How much is it worth to you? Paula's hand struck with fury across his face. His cheek went numb. Blood ran from an uneven gash left by the diamond in her ring. He took out his handkerchief and dabbed at the wound. You're real high class, aren't you, Paula? They don't make traitors as high class as you any more. She raised her hand and aimed for the other cheek. Thompson bolted out of his chair and grabbed her. I suggest you have a drink, Miss Ralston. Let us handle the rest. Paula was furious. He's not going to tell you any more. We'll handle the rest. Thompson didn't raise his voice, 
but there was a firmness, a deadly conviction in his inflection. Paula went for a drink. Harry didn't like that. Paula had a temper. He could deal with her. But the others, they displayed very little emotion. He had no idea how to handle them. Thompson sat down again, facing Harry. The fact is, he began gracefully, we discovered this microphone, and four others like it, here in Miss Ralston's apartment, one in each room. Now, we are very cautious people, Mr. Payne. We are quite certain no one knows our whereabouts. It is logical, then, that the microphones have not been here long. Miss Ralston's only visitors are ourselves and you. You have known her two days. So you are the only person who knows this apartment well enough to have planted these telltale devices in a hurry. Why should I want to plant them? You took the trouble to have Miss Ralston investigated, but more than one means of investigation produces better results. The microphones were wired to a small radio which we located in the basement of this building. We have assumed that everything spoken into them was transmitted over the radio and recorded at your end. That makes sense, doesn't it? Harry was confused. So far, so good. We want those recordings, Mr. Payne. They seemed to be convinced the microphones were his. Only Harry knew it wasn't true. But to admit it might mean he wouldn't leave Paula's place alive. He derived no comfort from the knowledge that someone else was interested in Paula's activities. That wasn't helping him with his problem of the moment. He could see no clear way out. He had to keep stalling, and as long as they were so sure of themselves it might even be to his advantage to maintain a certain arrogance. I might as well tell you, Thompson, I have no intention of cooperating until I know a few facts about you and your friends, like who you are, where you're from, what you're after, it is not necessary, in order to tell us where the recordings are, smiled Mr. Thompson, that you know anything more about us. It isn't necessary, said Harry, but I want to know. Chase started to voice an objection, but Harry broke in. And don't tell me you have more persuasive ways of making me talk. You can use force, but it'll take time. Your time is valuable, or you wouldn't have hustled me over here as fast as you did. So let's not waste your time. You tell me, then I'll tell you. Thompson glanced at his two compatriots. Their faces registered dissatisfaction. Their silence said that Harry was right. Time was valuable they would follow the path of least resistance. Our point of origin, Mr. Thompson began, is Coriella, roughly seven-eighths the size of Earth, in the Simbric Galaxy. It is approximately, in your figures, seventy-five trillion miles distant. Must be quite a trip, Harry tried to be placid. Mr. Thompson was momentarily amused. Travel through time and space is something we take for granted. The farthest corners of the universe are ours for the reaching. That is the foremost reason for our visit to your Earth. You might call us galactic observers. You see, we already control the twelve inhabited planets in our own galaxy, and at this time we have no desire to take on any more responsibility than that. But neither do we want interference from another galaxy such as this one. Harry was surprised. You're giving this world a lot of credit. We've barely moved off the earth. What makes you think we could cause your people any trouble? By merely projecting yourselves into space, you have eliminated the major obstacle to space travel. Remember, it took thousands of years for someone on your Earth to discover electricity. But observe the wonders you have accomplished with it in the relatively few years since it was discovered. The same principle applies to your conquest of space. We are not here to do you harm, Mr. Payne. It is merely our intention to warn you, when the time comes, 
of the dangers you face should you decide to venture too far. For people who intend no harm, I'd say you and your friends are putting on quite an unconvincing show. I assure you, Mr. Payne, our visit to Earth was intended purely for observational purposes. What do you mean, was? Thompson's face was grim. The easy chair that had accommodated his small, roundish frame so perfectly now appeared to be uncomfortable for him. A redness crept into his cheeks and spread over his smooth, tight scalp. The fact is that your government has known about us for six months. Our exact whereabouts has been a well-guarded secret, but they were informed of our presence here on Earth. Informed? But who could tell them? Chase broke in impatiently. We are wasting time. We must get those recordings. The interruption was dismissed with a wave of Thompson's hand. Your government was informed by George Fisher. George Fisher? Harry gulped. You see, Mr. Fisher, that wasn't really his name, you understand, was one of us, a member of our observation team. After we arrived here, well, you might say he defected, gave your government the benefit of his somewhat limited knowledge. Harry whistled. And because of him your mission is no longer observational? That remains to be seen. Harry leaned forward on the sofa. You have any ideas, Mr. Thompson, about why he defected? I'm curious to know why a man is unhappy enough with his own lot to run away and put himself in the hands of a civilization that is in every way alien to him. Thompson's answer was brief and deliberately ambiguous. Mr. Fisher was a traitor. What more can be said of him? So he didn't commit suicide, Harry muttered. That's right, Mr. Payne. I take it you're not sure of how much Fisher told the government before you got to him. Mr. Fisher's limitations were familiar to us. It is the potential of your own scientists, now that they have his information, that we are most concerned with. Keep stalling, Harry reminded himself. Keep speculating, guessing, theorizing, anything for time. So you know the project that Weapons Development is working on, but you don't know how much progress has been made, and you want to place one of your own people in there to find out. Thanks to you, we have succeeded in doing just that. Thompson smiled with satisfaction, having kept his part of a bargain. Now, about those recordings. I'm not through asking questions. But I'm through answering them, Mr. Payne. Tell us where the recordings are. Harry studied the clean, smooth surface of Thompson's face. There was a gentleness in his large round eyes. There was also an unfriendliness. Harry had to keep stalling. He knew any answer he gave them would shorten his life expectancy by about thirty-five years. You've gotten me into a mess of trouble, Mr. Thompson. I think you owe me a little more. My memory might prove clearer if I knew what was going on at weapons development. Thompson glanced at his two companions. They showed no sign of dissent. Very well, Mr. Payne. For some years now our people have been working on a method of reversing the polarity of the atom. We have tried to create an electromagnetic field which would repel rather than attract. Once we are able to accomplish this, we can develop an instrument capable of disturbing the molecular structure of any object in the universe. In other words, Harry frowned at him, a weapon capable of disintegration? Precisely. Harry sat there, stunned. A few moments seemed hardly enough to digest the knowledge that weapons development was working on the most incredibly advanced weapon of all time, and Mr. Thompson and company were out to sabotage it. Their people could not afford to allow another world to beat them to the punch. Who controlled this weapon controlled the universe. Stalling the aliens was more important than ever now. 
He couldn't heighten the danger to his own life. It wasn't worth a lead nickel anyway. If it had been, Thompson wouldn't have consented to tell him this much. Someone had wired Paula's apartment. It was reasonable to assume it was someone on his side. The recordings, please. Bowles was becoming very impatient. Harry looked up and found a gun at his head. The recordings are at my office, he lied. Thompson walked to the telephone table and brought the instrument to him. You will call your secretary, he said, and tell her you have been detained at lunch. You are sending Mr. Chase to pick up the recordings. Harry glanced around the room. Paula was sulking at the bar near the door, drowning her conscience, he thought. They must have paid her a fortune to sell out her own people. Bowles and Chase both had their guns poised. Thompson picked up the receiver and extended it to him. There was no way out, no stalling them any longer. To make a break for it would be suicidal. In the state of confusion his mind was in, he could think of only one thing to do. When he reached Miss Conway he would have to warn her somehow, a few desperate words and pray that she would be alert enough to realize he was in trouble and get the information to the authorities. He took the phone and dialed. He gave the Fort Dixon operator his office extension. He waited. The phone rang. It rang again. Then three more times. Damn that girl! Her coffee breaks were extended vacations. Finally the phone was picked up. But the voice that answered was male. Who is this? Harry demanded. The voice replied, Colonel Waters. This is Harry. I'm at Paula Ralston's apartment. Emergency! The three men were on top of him. Chase smashed the butt of his gun across Harry's knuckles. The receiver fell to the floor. Harry let out a pained groan as Boyle's gun butt struck him on the temple. Thompson replaced the receiver. Harry was on the floor. He put his hands to his head for protection as Chase savagely kicked at him. His vision blurred, but he managed to see that Paula was still at the bar sipping a drink, sadistically enjoying the whole show. "'He's no longer of any use to us,' Thompson declared. "'You may do your job.' Harry shook his head, fighting to stay conscious. His vision cleared long enough to see Chase and Bowles standing over him, their guns pointed at either side of his head. There was a volley of deafening shots. There was smoke, voices, people running in every direction, more gunfire, glass shattering, furniture knocked over. But Harry felt no pain. When he looked again, Chase and Bowles were no longer to be seen. He caught a glimpse of Thompson running for another position of cover. A final gunshot brought him to the floor. Harry struggled to a sitting position. Then he saw Chase and Bowles dead on the floor beyond the sofa. Half a dozen soldiers were in the process of subduing a swearing, clawing Paula Ralston. And in the doorway he saw Miss Conway. She looked incongruous as hell, with a smoldering revolver in her hand. She crossed the room and knelt beside him. She pulled him around to let his head rest on the sofa. "'Harry, Harry,' she whispered, brushing his hair back. "'Are you hurt badly? What did they do to you?' He tried to get up. "'You stay right where you are, honey.' Her voice was soothing and gentle. There was a soft, compassionate light in her eyes. No longer that dumb stare. She leaned over and kissed him. "'There, you're going to be all right.' "'What the hell are you doing here?' Harry bellowed. Now you just sit back and relax. I'm just doing my job. You're ju— A low, steady wail rolled off his lips. Oh, no. Say it isn't so. Tell me I'm really dead. I know I deserve to be. I may be the world's lousiest secretary, but I'm considered not bad in the counterintelligence department. Harry repeated the wail. We were afraid from the time George Fisher turned himself over to the government, she continued, that his days were numbered. But the longer he remained alive, the more apprehensive his people would become. 
We figured one day they'd make a wrong move, and that would be their big mistake. Well, their move was to kill George Fisher and try to get one of their own agents into weapons development. That meant exposing themselves. It also meant you had to be watched, among others. That's where I came in. And playing it about as dumb as I've ever seen. She laughed. <laughs> Sounds like I played the part a little too convincingly. She stood up and helped him to his feet. You're coming with me. Where to? Hey, what are you doing? There's something about this place that I don't like. I'm no sultry brunette, but I'm not a dumb blonde, either. She kissed him, then took a last look at Paula's place, and led him out the door. End of The Observers End of Four Science Fiction Stories by G. L. Vandenberg These stories recorded by Phil Chenevere in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, May of 2013.